and um, we wanted to uh, open up the floor for any questions that anyone has, anything about the, the practice, teachings, the, also uh, we're very happy to speak both about the Anakampa project or the Bikuni order, any of those things. So, um, if you have any questions, please fire away and we'll share the answers. So the question was um, if we could say something about the Bikini Project, and I think you're referring to the Bikini Project in the UK. So uh, what would you like to know? Is it, is it the first? Is it, it the is, first yeah. yeah. So this started basically when um, I was talking to my teacher, Ajahn Brahm. I was living in Australia at the time. Um, and I wasn't sure what my next steps are on the path, sort of what kind of environment would be good for me to grow in. And I said to him, let's talk about possibilities. And I very casually said, what about England? And he jumped on it straight away. He said, yes, that's what you should do. And suddenly the whole conversation came alive and it felt like, oh, he's quite serious. <laughs> and I said, uh, 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 okay, I just forgot about it for two months. I was still on Rain's retreat. And then uh, I had a trip planned back to England for just a two-month family visit. And before I, I left, I said to him, uh, were you serious about that England idea? And he said, yes. Just go there and see, you know, see what the climate's like. And I said, well, I don't know anybody. Have you got any contacts? No, I haven't. Just go there and find out. <laughs> so I thought, hmm, that's, you know probably not going to happen for years, but I got back and um, the first person I contacted who I'd worked on a project before with in, uh, to create a book for Ajahn Brahm's 40th uh, anniversary as a monk, um, he replied to me and said, I've been waiting for this for years, I didn't know if this was ever going to happen, please let me be involved, you know, I can do the website. Uh, and, um, and I said, oh, okay. And then another lady expressed the same kind of interest. So I phoned up Ajahn Graham and said, um, well, it seems like there's a couple of people who are interested, but I mean, it can't happen because you'd have to come over, you know. I couldn't just do anything unless you come over and sort of tell people about it and, you know, get some exposure. And he said, yeah, sure, I'll come in October. So this was last year. And I had no one on my team, really. So <laughs> I suddenly thought, gosh, I don't think I can go back to Perth if um, I've got to organise his tour to England. And after that, I guess, we just started putting word out a little bit, and people came on board. So Lushani and Sanjaya and Hiranti, who've been also organising Ajahn Brown's tours in the past, they sort of tapped into their network, and then Amina, who's also here, came on board, and she just heard about the project and wanted to help. So gradually we got a team together and organised the first uh, big event with Ajahn Brown last year, and um, we actually uh, received quite significant donations, um, which, were, which made me realise this is a real possibility. And then the team that we had, the trustees and Amino as well, um, who's pretty much like a trustee without the legal responsibility, <laughs> um, applied for charity status, charitable status. Um, and it took many months of putting together this application and they were very diligent and particular and, you know, really trying to do a good job. And we put it in on March 12th this year and we got registered as a charity on April the 12th, wow. only a month later. In the meantime, I've been to um, visit Venerable Ananda Bodhi and the nuns in the Loka Vihara and that's been great for me because I've learned about how they started things, and not only how they started things, but the result of sticking with that for so long through all the difficulties of establishing monasteries, learning to live in community, starting to teach. You know, it's kind of like it's not just a learning <coughs> curve; it's a kind of really steep <laughs> cliff, and uh, and it's just incredibly inspiring to see a bikuni monastery really working and generating so much goodness and attracting young women who giving up jobs. Like, one of them's a PhD scientist, and I don't think she's been meditating that long. A couple of years. A couple of years. Yeah. And just coming to visit and getting so kind of inspired, and, and also seeing the benefit that it has for her practice, that now she wants to ordain. And realizing, gosh, this is 
you know, creating so much happiness, even for people that never visit, just knowing that this is happening. So this is kind of my vision, but like I say, it's come very ad hoc, and um, we have no idea where it's going next, but I feel like it's not about me, it's just about planting the intention, and then the people who are interested seem to gather, and um, yeah, yeah, and so it's happening in this way. Well, there isn't a place, you see. No. I mean, I live from house to house. <laughs> there are a few people here who I've stayed with for a few days, very kindly. I try not to stay too long with any anyone because I don't want to outstay. Well, not even outstay because people are very welcoming, but it's, it's good to feel that you're light on people. So I've spent time with generous lay supporters, also in monasteries, retreat centres. It's really about just connecting with the with the UK scene, really, and international bhikkhuni sangha, international supporters. So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for your question. So, I, I'm sure there's just kind of at the beginnings of, of you know, it's like it's like the the seed is is landing over here and it's beginning to germinate, but it hasn't really put roots down yet, and it can only happen with the support if, if there's interest and support from the lay community. It's the only the only way it can happen. And, and um, you know, when when we were starting our place in in America, we didn't know. It was always a sense of like, well, we don't know if it's going to work. We don't know if it's going to work. And, it was, you know, it's only possible. I mean, through it'll also be through Aisha's hard work. She's learning. She's learning about, <laughs> but, but uh, and practice. But it's also, it needs you. You know, it needs you to make it happen if you want it to. Mm. But then, and I was just reflecting as I was sitting here in the beginning, and thinking about the monastery here, the temple here. You know, it's, it started with an intention. Somebody had the intention for this to happen. And then the intention of the bhikkhus to to ordain also in the beginning, you know, and then to come to the UK, and then it's like that's what it begins with an intention, the interest, and like the heart is inspired, and then and then there's the you know the, the speech and the action that, that follows that, that that brings it into reality. So uh, it's an opportunity. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful one. So the question is about how to formally uh, cultivate equanimity in meditation practice. <coughs> so uh, I think one of the one of the things we we often think of with equanimity is this sense of balance, of everything's kind of even. But uh, my experience is life is not like that, and the mind is not like that, and the body is not like that. So it's kind of challenging. Um, so um, one way. That uh, is, I can give you an image of, of, that I use um, of, a, as, of a pendulum. So you know, often that we experience, like maybe we're sitting, and then there's, and the mind's clear and settled, and then some pain starts to arise, and then it gets agitated, and then there's an attachment to the pain, or maybe worrying about the pain, or something like that, or averse to the pain, and then so we're not, we're out of balance, and. Uh, you know, then, then we try and pull away from that to come to some balanced place, but we get into this kind of tangle where we're trying to make things even. So uh, rather than trying to make everything even, to have a sense of a, a pendulum swinging, you know, when, when a pendulum swings, you know, the, the, the bottom of the pendulum is, is, you know, it's going right, it's going left, it's good, bad, difficult, nice, you know, all of that. But at the top of the pendulum, it's staying in one point. It's not moving. It's just it's just holding everything there, and then that is so. So you so moving your attention from the pendulum at the bottom of this is I like this, I don't like this, this is nice, this is painful, whatever. Move move up to the top where you've got a more of a bird's eye view of, of what's going on. And actually, in, uh, the San, in Sanskrit, the the there's also this word upekan would be translated as bird's eye view. That's that's how you literally translate it from the Sanskrit. So it's like, um, rather than being involved in the details, you're, you're getting a broader perspective. And personally, I do it in different ways. So you can do it as a contemplation of, you know, so sitting in meditation, contemplating, 
uh, the arising and passing away of things, that, that can bring a sense of opaque. Or um, sometimes uh, having just having a sense of cosmological time, like, you know, like, here we are in a tiny moment of time in, the, in history. So just having a, like a reflection on that, and it gives space, gives like a, um, a different perspective on whatever is, is arising in the moment. So then you can be with whatever is arising, it's, it's all fine. Even if it's excruciating and painful, it's, it's fine. Even if it's breaking your heart, it's fine. Because you know it's just, this is how it is in this moment in time, it's just like this, and it's changing. It won't be like this forever. So it's, it's getting that, uh, just letting the mind broaden. Does that make sense? same kind of uh, thread really um, about expanding the heart. I think uh, there are sort of two different ways or two different types in a way of equanimity and one is the kind of equanimity that comes through observing like impermanence and contemplating non-self and suffering and that's more kind of awareness that's quite general and that sees things coming, you know, arising and passing. And then there's another kind, which is the equanimity of the Brahma Viharas. And that's quite <coughs> interesting, because I, I see the Brahma Viharas almost as sequential. And I think you can't have equanimity without the other three. It's not a dry state, it's not a kind of indifferent state. So I think that the other three Brahma, Brahma Viharas are basically um, expanding the heart and creating a kind of very deep inner resource of happiness and nourishment so that the heart is very nourished and it has that sense of well-being. And from this basis, the things that enter the heart have less of an impact. So it's about cultivating as well, as well as the open awareness. When you started the monastery in California, did you say you had to separate it uh, from a monastery tradition? Mm -hmm. What was the reason for that? <laughs> so, uh, we went there to some branch monastery for women because there was, there's only, the only places were Amrabati and Chittas, which are mixed communities, and we uh, felt for many years it would be good to have a place just for nuns. So, there were two things. One was a set, once, you know, the, we had the Sila Dara. Uh, ordination, or I don't know if you know it, and it's a little bit similar to the Dasa Sila Mantha, where it's, it's kind of made up a little bit, you know, it's like ten precepts with with a Vinaya, a very good Vinaya, actually. Um, but it's not, um, it's not recognised, it's not, uh, it's not, it, what didn't come from the Buddha, it came from monks in England, you know, in the 70s and 80s, 80s. <coughs> so, uh, it, it's, it's, even though it's a very good training, and it worked, and I'm very incredibly grateful for it actually, and, and also to be able to have trained in a community of other nuns, with other nuns. When you take it outside of that, of the kind of protection of the, of the, the um, mixed community that's being supported, and, and there's, there's sort of like a, a shared agreement that yes, this is, this is acceptable, you know, you take it out of there into another culture, it, it doesn't, it doesn't kind of take root. Because it's it's not um, it hasn't been passed down from the Buddha. It doesn't have the power of that, and so that was part of it. And also um, around us, there were these women who were were had taken bhikkhuni ordination quite not far away, from living not so far away from us. And and the the Ajahn Chah lineage. So in terms of Ajahn Chah himself and, and that teaching, I, I don't feel I'm left that. I have to say, because I think that teaching is very profound and beautiful. But uh, the lineage itself doesn't accept bikini ordination. So, and the Ajahn Chah lineage very, very strongly have um, said very clearly that they, they, will, they you cannot do that in, in that lineage. So we felt like, you know, we can't, it doesn't feel right to stay, you know, part of this kind of prestigious lineage in, with an ordination that's not really recognized while there are women forging ahead, they're really putting their neck on the line actually to, to uh, reopen full ordination for women. So
so for me it was um, it was just a, it was actually when I was on in retreat I, it, it became very clear like we have I, we have to take Bikuni ordination I had to do it I had to take Bikuni ordination because it's uh, you know our order was it was too it was too small a world the Sivadar order for me for, for, for expanding out into another culture and um, there had also been I don't know right now but there had also been some issues around that time but it was, we'd started moving over to America but during the time that we were moving over there um, there was a, a very strong um, kind of reprimandry from the Bhikkhu Sangha that you know this is you should not consider Bhikkhu on the nation this is you can only be Sidra and you will always be subordinate to the monks and, and this issue you was accepted and this is how it is and if you don't accept that then you have to leave and you should also that we shouldn't use the sila draft form as a, as a means to take the kuni ordination so so um there are actually two of us who who left we were both senior nuns in Amravati and then we left and became very junior bikunis which is very good practice and um we uh we went back and we we took leave in a very honorable way um, and then we took seminary papajar, you know, even though we'd been ten at nuns for many years, and we and we spent six months of seminaries, even though we had many years of ten priests already. And then we took bikini ordination late that year, so that we didn't go straight from Sudra to bikini, but we honoured that agreement you know, and left it and started afresh. And uh, you know, it's controversial. You know, some people think it's wrong that we can't, that it, they can't do bikini ordination in that lineage. Some people think it's wrong that we left and took bikini ordination. It's kind of a controversial thing. And uh, I know for myself, um, I couldn't have not done it any more than I could have not <coughs> ordained in the first place. I, I, it was like the heart knew, this is, you've got to do this. And there was a time when we really didn't know, you know, we, we, we didn't know if we'd be supported in America, actually, because... Uh, it was kind of a risk uh, to do it, but it, it, there was a sense of it has to be done because it's right, you know, because it's what the Buddha gave. The Buddha gave that, and and it's a worldwide movement. You know, it's not like just a few renegade nuns going off and taking for the nation. It's, it's like it's it's re-emerging all over the world. The Bikini order. So it's like it's time now. You know, it's been under it's been it's been kept underground for a long time, and women have lived as nuns and, and not been recognized as nuns for, for you know, almost a thousand years, actually, in the Theravada tradition. And now it's coming back, because it's time. Yeah. And I can also say that I, I noticed, um, uh, you know, when I took Anagarika precepts in, in Amaravati, I felt this um, kind of download, I felt this sense of like a... a stepping into a, a lineage or, or, a, or a stream of, of blessings. And I had a, a lot of joy. I was kind of in bliss for a couple of weeks after I first took the precepts. And there's this sense of like stepping into this, what has been given by the Buddha, this, this stream of blessings. And I felt that throughout my time as an Anagarika. And then when I took the Siddhartha, this is personal to me, but when I took the Siddhartha ordination, <coughs> which is you know, kind of a made-up ordination, I, it was like being knocked out of that that wasn't coming through in the same way and it was much more of a struggle. I felt like, oh, I've, I've just received this big burden now but I, I want to help carry it because I want there to be something good for, for women you know, in, in the Sangha. So, but it didn't feel like an extreme of blessings. It felt like, oh, oh, okay, we've got to carry this heavy thing together now. And then when I took the Bikuni ordination in 2011, again, there's a sense of like, back, back in that stream of blessings because it's, it's given by the Buddha. It's, it's just different. Luke. Yeah, um, I can tell the great teacher, and um, he had to start in Thailand, so much influenced by that culture and so on. But even within that tradition, there were quite a few of us, I think, who, who, were, who felt that it was quite right that women should become the Kunis. And I don't know whether people probably already know here, but do you need to explain about that and Brown, or we don't already? Because he was a great way from the same. Yeah, it's good. Thank you. So the question.
question was, well, more a reflection was uh, that mm. within that tradition, which I wouldn't really call the Ajahn Chah tradition, I'd more call it the Wat Papa tradition, yeah, because right. Ajahn Chah isn't here anymore. We don't actually know what he, position he would have taken. You know, he was quite a rebel too. And my experience is the more you practice on the path, the more you make decisions from your own authentic understanding of the Dhamma, rather than through what the tradition tells you. Um, so I think, yeah, you're right that there were a lot of monks at the time who actually were quite upset by this. I met one of them recently, actually, who actually disrobed um, pretty much due to, to what happened because the women weren't allowed to take the bikini ordination in what upon lineage. Um, so Ajahn Brahm uh, trained with Ajahn Chah also for nine years in Thailand, um, and he moved to Perth in 1980. <coughs> Four, I think, um, and at that time there were no nuns in the community, but they started a bhikkhu monastery for monks. Um, and then after a while, they realised that it would be good for some nuns to have their own monastery too. Um, and they invited Ajahn Vayama, who was then a ten precept nun in Sri Lanka, um, to come and live in Australia. Um, they actually purchased a piece of land, not very small, at six hundred acres. <laughs> and she lived in a little caravan on on the one of the ridges there for about two years on her own just to kind of make this space for women. Um, and eventually, I think two or three other nuns joined, and they lived there for um, it would have been quite a long time, maybe ten years or so, as ten percent nuns. And eventually, they decided that they would like to take the bikini ordination. So I think also Bhante Sajato, who's one of Ajahn Graham's um, students, a, a bhikkhu senior monk, he was very instrumental in discussing this with the nuns and also with Ajahn Graham and saying, well, you know, it seems that there are no legal kind of uh, obstacles. According to Vinaya, there's nothing preventing them doing this. And Ajahn Graham is someone who I feel has an authentic experience of, of Dhamma at a very deep level. And he's very open-minded. So although he's quite traditional in many senses, if something feels right and feels ethical, he will review his position. Um, so over time, the discussions continued, and, and he decided to facilitate the ordination. He didn't ordain the bikinis, because the bikinis actually are ordained by other bikinis. So they brought another senior nun called Aya Tataloka. I think she's the senior most Western Theravada bikini. They brought her over to Perth and um, she ordained these four women and Ajahn Brahm confirmed the ordination. So it's a dual ordination. First you ordain with the bikini sangha and then the bhikkhu sangha kind of give you their blessing in a way. Um, and it's seen as a dual ordination. So it's kind of foolproof. <laughs> um, so you're accepted into the sangha as a whole. And uh, I think they took this decision because Ajahn Brahm's understanding is that each monastery, whatever tradition it belongs to, is actually, according to Vinaya, a separate um, kind of sangha. So each sangha makes its own decisions as a community, and those <coughs> decisions don't have to go through any kind of senior um, branch monastery. That's actually not according to Vinaya, that's more a, a tradition that's been handed down from Wapapong. So I think he knew that um, the Wat Papom lineage were probably not getting very far in, in approaching the idea of bikini ordination. Um, and he took the decision to go ahead. Now, I'm not sure he knew what the consequences might be, but I just heard um, a, a talk by him only two weeks ago on YouTube today. And he was talking about authenticity and trusting one's intuition. And he said the most difficult decision of his whole life was not to ordain the bikinis, because that was clear, but it was the time that he was called to Thailand after he ordained the bikinis. The, the senior monks in Thailand were very upset, and they called him to Thailand to meet the council of the elders to basically get a reprimand. So he went over there, and you know, just with the president of the Buddhist Society in Australia, so just him and one other person, um, and he had to meet this very senior council, and many of the Western monks were also there. And um, they basically told him that, you know, he's no longer part of that lineage, and he can no longer be sort of classified as a branch monastery. But then they gave him this clause, 
And they said, um, you know, basically you're going to lose your connection with this branch monastery, which are, are John Graham's friends from 20, 30 years, you know, practicing together in Thailand. And like family, really. You know, when you grow up with other monks or other nuns, it's, it's a family. Um, but if you decide to basically say that that bhikkhuni ordination was invalid and it was a mistake and these women are not bhikkhunis, we won't kick you out. You can you can stay and there'll be no consequence. We'll just put it down to you know, experience. And he said, you know, at that moment he just had to look in his heart and it was like, well, I can't do that because that's not true and I know the right thing to do is to say that these women are now bikinis and he actually you know, in the YouTube video, he said, so he just decided, bye-bye, what papa? Bye-bye. So that was, uh, that was it. I mean, things, yeah, I mean, I don't really want to talk more about what happened afterwards, but I think from his perspective, because I know him very closely, and um, I know his monks, you know, his senior monks, and, uh, and the bikinis as well, I've lived there for four years. Um, and I think he let go of it very quickly because he knew that he'd done the right thing. And now that you know he's seeing that women are coming, even if it's only a few, you, know, you can't say, "Well, it's only four nuns, so never mind." You know, it won't make much difference because those four nuns are now seeds. Wherever they go, they have the potential to start a whole new community. And actually, most of them are living separately. Um, so one of them's in now the abbot of Damasara Monastery, which has about which has a lot of nuns, actually. That's where I lived. It has about probably ten <coughs> bikinis by now, and probably another three seminaries, and there were a lot of applicants. And then another one went to Santi Monastery in Australia, in Sydney. Um, and it's quite, it's more like a hermitage at the moment, but, you know, she's a senior nun too, so an amazing forest monastery. So little by little, it's happening, and uh, each nun becomes a seed. Does that sort of answer? Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to say about Amaravati because it's you know it's local and uh, I think probably some of you go there and it's um, so it's it kind of gets complicated because there's the practice and I have to say you know I lived in that monastery in that community for many years the practice is good you know there's the sila is good the practice is good the Teaching is good. It's it's not a bad. It's not that it's a bad place. It's a it's a particular view about ordination, and uh, and it's also an, an adherence to to a cultural tradition. So Amaravati has that that they they they've taken that position of we don't allow bikini ordination here, and if you want to take bikini ordination, you can't be part of this community. That's the, that's the position. But that doesn't mean that the practice isn't good, actually. I think that's really important to, to distinguish that. And I just spent a few days with the, the one of the founding nuns of that community. So I have, you know, there's, there's, yeah, when I first arrived in, in the UK, I went to Scotland, and I spent some time with Ajahn Siri, who's one of the founders of the Siddharth Order. And uh, at the end, when I was leaving, because now I was much junior to her as a Siddharth, and now I'm a Bikuni, so technically senior. So at the end, she said, before you go, I, I would like to just pay my respects to you as a bikini, you know, not to me, as, but just to the bikini form in honouring that. And, and so she bowed to, to the to the bikini robe. And then I said, if technically you're not supposed to, but I said, you know, and I'd like to pay my respects to you as, as a founder of, as, of the order, as, as an elder who gave me a, a wonderful foundation in practice. So, you know, she bowed to me, I bowed back to her because... It's, 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 I think this is the thing in the, in the nuns' situation worldwide. It's kind of complicated mm -hmm. in Taravada because you have very senior nuns who haven't been able to take full donation, but they have a good practice and they are worthy of respect. And then you have, you know, those who, who are taking the good donation. So it's just to, dis just to distinguish the difference between practice and ordination. It's not that, uh, you know, if you don't allow bikini ordination, you're not worthy of respect. It's just, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a limitation. Yeah. 
I also had a nice experience meeting one of the seniors, Sina um in December in uh, Hamburg. And um, <coughs> it was really lovely because I have genuine respect for anyone who's taken uh, an ordination. I ordained as an eight precept nun in Burma uh, eight years before I took the Bukuni ordination. And for me, that was my ordination. It was a renunciation, a full renunciation from my heart. But I think eventually it feels limited in terms of not having much to pass on to future generations. Um, so I completely agree that, you know, the Bikuni ordination doesn't equate also to good practice. It's, it, the practice is from the heart, you know, it depends on each individual's wisdom and cultivation and conditions that they meet. Um, so there's nothing like we're superior or there's you know, anything inferior, it's not about that, but it's about looking for the most conducive conditions. And um, anyway, so I met this uh, um, wonderful nun in Hamburg, Ajahn Chittapala, and um, she also was very respectful to, to, you know, the bhikkhuni ordination that I'd taken, basically, because you can see that this is something that's going to benefit women. And uh, we had a really nice little sort of interaction one day when we went for the lunch, because people were offering us the food for lunch. So usually, you know, the senior nun would go ahead in the queue, and then the junior nun would go behind. So I said to her, you, you go ahead. Also because she was teaching the retreat there, you know, and it just felt right. And she said, no, no, you're a bikini, you go ahead. And I said, no, you know, and she said, no, go ahead, you know. Which I thought was very humble and quite touching, but I thought, okay, yeah, you're right, it's not about individuals, it's just about their form, you know, like a bikini is technically a high ordination. So we went for lunch and people looked a bit, she felt like she had to sort of explain something, so mm -hmm. she said, oh, she's going ahead, you know, because she's a bikini, it's almost like she's driving a Mercedes and I'm driving a, a BMW. <laughs> and I said, oh, just, yeah, maybe, but it depends on who's driving. <laughs> and she laughed and she said, that's great, that's great, and it was just a lovely moment and everybody kind of got it, you know. We kind of understood that ultimately it's about yeah our own inner development and the ordination is a kind of it's a holding. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think we I think it's a sensitive thing. It's also between the nuns, but with the right attitude of mutual respect, kindness, you know, mm -hmm. learning from each other, honouring the dhamma. I think we can create cordial relations. Also, I got a very touching invitation just recently mm. from the senior nun at Amravati to join Ajahn Samedo's retreat in uh, Amravati. He'd just come back from Thailand for, I don't know, possibly the last retreat. It was a very major event, and, um, and they realized they had a spare place, and they said, we'd like you to come, because you've been living here for some time. I've been there as a guest for many months, actually, several times. Um, and I was so touched by that. So I think people can get beyond the politics and the ordination thing. It's always about meeting people as individuals and respecting each other's aspiration and the beauty of that. We've got quite a while, according to the schedule, so if anybody else wants to um, <coughs> ask questions or raise dumber points or topics, or the space is yours, really. It doesn't have to be uh, you asking us questions and us giving you the answer. You can also contribute, because we learn that way, and it's important to learn. I think it's fascinating, the attitude between... Um, what women can do, what they can't do, and it tends to be cultural in different countries, but also, I'm quite old now, and when, my, when I was young, my, my parents' uh, generation certainly had an attitude. It's not that women were better or worse, it was just that there was a particular way, this is a woman's position and this is a man's position, and that changes over time. And if you go to different countries, then uh, sometimes you have them uh, holding these different views and not necessarily feeling that uh, women are unprivileged, that's the Western way of looking at it. When you're looking at the Thai tradition, so I spent time in traditional Thai temples, then uh, in Thai culture generally, 
get those things through anchor and other things that are in place. Then, then when we have that volition and that comes out volition, and within the temple itself, that also works. So I, as a Westerner, really doesn't matter to me very much. So I was there for the for the experience. When we went to drama uh, talks or something in the hall, then I sat at the back because I was just a, a deck watch and uh, not really very special. But they felt uncomfortable because I was a man and I was just sit up at the front. So there was this big sort of dialogue that went on which we tried to resolve. And the monks agreed with me that I was not... Uh, Observing all the precepts at the time, which suited me very well, so <coughs> quite like I should sit at the back. So, in the end, we came to a sort of compromise. I said, Well, look, when I go out on Pinterbat and I take things seriously, then I'll do my eight precepts. And just so you all know, I'll wear white. When I'm wearing white, then you can put me at the front. If I'm not, <laughs> you can put me at the back. <laughs> but it's always the way around. <laughs> Well, maybe I'll tell you one other thing. <laughs> you said that um, you wondered whether Ratan Brahm knew what controversy he would call himself. Uh, I don't think he did. The extent of it, yeah. Because I, I happened to be in, um, it was in Oslo, actually. We did some very wonderful talks there. Where, sorry? Oslo. In Oslo. Ah, yeah. In Norway. Oh, that's where right. I was staying in another time. That's right, yeah. And um, I went to several of his talks and got, I, well, I've met him before anyway, but I've been quite well. And then, uh, and then I had to go to the airport to meet some other months, and so I shared a car with him going back to the airport. And um, he, I said, I knew a little about it, and I said, uh, are you really thinking about this? And he said, oh yes. And, and I said, well, this was uh, on Friday night. And he, I said, well, how long is it going to take that for knowing these things We've gone for years and years and years. He said, oh, next Tuesday, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so I let the nuns know in Amrabati, and I think nobody realized it was going to happen that quickly. But he certainly didn't know what the consequences were. No. no um, but there was a lot of dialogue then about whether it was right, whether it was wrong, and it could have gone on forever and ever and ever. So, so I think he felt that it was the right thing to do. I, I certainly agree, and many of us do. Just one of those things, one of those cultural things that can be interesting. Yeah, because sometimes Adrian Brown, I know, was criticised for not sort of discussing this with um, other Sangha members, but I think that is just the perspective of not discussing it in detail this time. I mean, I'm sure they've had a lot of discussions in the past with the Wapa Pong. Uh, Mm. Because, but actually in Oslo he was discussing it widely, wasn't he? And yes, inviting not. feedback from all kinds of people, yeah, and I think other Buddhist groups. So he's been much more internationally active than mm. many people in the Wapapong tradition. You know, he goes to global conferences, he goes mm. to like conferences on mental health and all kinds of conferences. You know, he set up the ASA in Australia, which is the Australian Sangha or, or Association. Australian Sangha Association, and that's um, to bring together Buddhists and monastics and lay practitioners from all traditions. So he's always consulted very widely with a, a very global and diverse um, Sangha, and there's also lay people. Um, yeah. So I think that also, you know, very, his, very sure that it was the right thing. And that people his wanted preceptor this. was a very one of the top um, officials in Thailand, yeah. so even after the breakup, he invited him to give the New Year's address in Bangkok. So he has his 14 at the very highest level, yeah. but that's enough. So yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like yeah. lots of organizations, they yeah. muddle along. Mm. Right. So, um, the, just to, to go back to the speaker, the Bikini, 
population resurgence. You know, it's it's also much bigger than the, the Wat Pa Pong Sangha is just one of many many sanghas that don't don't accept bhikkhuni ordination. I mean, in Burma, just just recently spoke to um, two Burmese nuns who live in California. They said if they were to go back to Burma, they would get arrested, arrested as soon as they stepped off the plane because they're Burmese bhikkhunis. So it's, it's very, very extreme there. Because there's these cultural views that have been carried on over hundreds of years and are seen as it has to be done this way. And then, uh, yeah, it's right. I feel like that too. And, um, and then there are, um, there are those who, who are looking in a different way of going back to, you know, well, what, what did the Buddha intend, you know, and, and what was what what possibilities did he give and what what can happen, how can we make it happen. So it tends to sort of fall into the work those who, who look at how can we make it happen and those who look at why it shouldn't happen because of that. And the motivation for why it shouldn't happen isn't always bad. Sometimes it's like feeling a sense of wanting to protect and you know, a f- fear of doing something that might be wrong and harming the same or long term, this kind of thing. If you don't mind about it, I, I wouldn't. Can I ask you um, why is it that you support the Kidney Organization? Yeah? I explain in English because oh. uh, yeah, I'm not fluent in English. So, yeah. There you go. Or maybe, can we give you, can you translate? Yes. Did you, 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 you ask the question again? So, so you, yeah. you, 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 you know, you've welcomed us here, and, and you, I saw it when, oh, so you've welcomed us here as bikinis, and, and I, I feel like, you know, you're supportive of Ayachanda as a bikini in this area. I saw all three of you, your faces were very um, open and, and, and very warm, you know, towards <laughs> Ayachanda. And um, so I, I'm curious, you know, I, I feel like for you it's, you are clear in your own hearts that this is a good thing. Yeah. And uh, and yet in, in Sri Lanka it's also controversial. You know, it's not like everybody says yes to becoming an organization in Sri Lanka. So I'm just curious, what, what, how do you come to the place of feeling that this is that this is right? What is it that motivates you to, to invite us here tonight? Yes. Oh, yeah. I can explain in Hello, yeah. Yes, and then she can translate. Yeah. Thank you. ंगीर प्रजापति गौतमी आचार्य उपाध्याय संप्रदाय स्वाभा लंकाटल महाबोधि 
බුදුහාමුදුරුවෝ පනෝකු නීති රීති තෙක්කලා කටයුතු කිරීමේ ඔකු ගැටලුවක් හානියක් නැහැ. ඒත් අපි කැමති ශාසනයේ කවුරු හරි කාන්තාව හෝ ඒවා उत्साहूलोतमी थी उटिंगली <laughs> 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 nicely explained um how from buddha's time um the vikni ordination was granted to mahaprajapati godmi and from that time onwards how sri lanka also had the vikni um ordination i think that's from um sangamitra in his time so um and then he also explained uh, at which point uh that the bikuni ordination disappeared in sri lanka or the bikuni lineage if you see me secretly um and that was he said it wasn't because uh, the bikuni lineage was not allowed or there were problems with keeping the bikuni ordination it was mainly due to uh, uh environmental conditions so uh Yeah, droughts, yeah. droughts that came in to Sri Lanka. So at that point, the bikus had to survive during the droughts, uh, whereas the bikunis weren't able to survive it. So that he feels that's why over time that the bikunis disappeared from Sri Lanka. And then uh, about how many years ago, Swamihansa? About twenty, thirty years ago, we re-established. So some of the bikunis had then gone to India. Ninety-six, I think. Ninety-six years. Oh, I see. Ninety-six, ninety-eight. Twenty years. Yes. Yeah. So recently, so twenty ninety from nineteen ninety-six. So there were some bikunis who then went to India during the drought seasons, uh, and then he explained how they were brought back. I think it was uh, bikunis from Burma as well, brought back to to establish uh, bikuni. Uh, lineage once again in Sri Lanka, so and as you said in 1996, so that's what uh, our venerable Vichita once said. So he he just took us through that, and then he um, um, very kindly sort of said why he and our venerables are supporting uh, Bikuni uh, lineage and Bikuni high ordination. Uh, he said that uh, it's mainly because he feels that that's what the Buddha said, uh, and that. Um, he supports it because he would like to see the dharma continue and the dharma should continue with the sangha the bhikkhus and the bhikkhunis so that sangha 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 ubato sangha yes ubato sangha so this is what he said so it's it's the bhikkhus and the bhikkhunis so that is why he is supporting it and uh, the four pillars yes <laughs> he did also mention that uh, the pasaka and the pasikas um and so that is why he is supporting it uh, and the venerables here are supporting bikuni high ordination so and he also mentioned uh, that the bikunis should have the support from the sangha and he is very appreciative that someone like ajahn brahm is supporting the bikunis uh, because the bikunis do need guidance and support from the sangha so this is why 
that Venerable Vichitavansan, the uh, other Venerables at the Thames Temple, are supportive uh, for the bhikkhunis and uh, for bhikkhuni sasana to take place in the UK to, to support the Dharma going forward. I hope I have explained it. Yes, <laughs> I just wanted to, you know, try and help. <laughs> you oh, understand? Thank you. I think Prishani did the best job well. <laughs> she did. So, so it's, it's very touching though, to hear that because uh, I feel like at the heart of your intention is, is for the Dharma to be available to, to anyone. Yeah. And that, that's so beautiful. Yeah. And, and I feel like, you know, it's, and you have the, the foresight, you know, you have the, the clarity that to see that it has to be bhikkhu bhikkhuni and upasika upasika it is it's great yeah thank you yeah that um comes from, straight from the text actually the buddha did say that um for the dhamma to last for the future there needed to be the bhikkhuni sangha the bhikkhu sangha and the lay women and lay men supporters. So that comes straight from the suttas, you know, that that is actually a necessary condition for the longevity of the Dhamma, so that it's available in the world. And it's interesting, actually, because I was recently in um, a meditation centre, and uh, and they also felt that they didn't really want to support Buddhism as a religion unless it had those four pillars. Mm -hmm. Some people there even said that they didn't want to identify as Buddhists unless it supported those four groups of people, the monastics, male, female, and the lay people. So that already shows how, you know, the longevity could be reduced because people won't come forward to support. They won't feel that it's a, a vehicle that offers, you know, fairness and equality and equal opportunities for people to develop themselves in the Dhamma. That means that we're not addressing suffering of all beings. So something's lacking because the matter, to my mind, is not complete. You had a question. Yeah. Loud and clear. What are the next steps for the Anika project? <laughs> so this gentleman, what's your name? Leo. Leo was asking um, what the next steps are for the Anikampa project and what sort of help we need. So the steps keep coming upon us as soon as uh, we take one, the next step becomes clear. We don't always see too far ahead, but um, there were a few things really. There were sort of things happening sort of in a gradated way, and there were things that sort of happen in the background all the time. Um, so at a practical level, the next big sort of thing that's <coughs> happening is Ajahn Brown will be coming back to England in October, October the 10th until the 18th this year and it'll be a, a second kind of benefit event program so all the ticket um, funds that don't cover our basic costs which is very little because we have sponsorship from another buddhist group um, all the the contributions coming in will go towards our project so we're still raising funds we're still at that point we've probably got half of the funds necessary for a preliminary place, maybe a four bedroom house, something like this, in the countryside. Uh, we've got about half of that. So we still need to focus on, on you know, bringing in the donations and, and, you know, along with that goes the awareness raising. Um, and so that will happen. Um, parts that are in the background are things like the networking. <laughs> I never like that word, but actually you have to. So I had to get onto Facebook last year, which was very painful. But um, through Facebook, we've met a lot of volunteers and even trustees. Um, so that's one thing people can do, actually, is to get on our annual Campo Bikini Project Facebook page and to see what's happening, what kind of events we're putting on, like teaching events like, like this. Um, that way we also learn about other Buddhist groups who want to invite us. Um, 
And we basically just try to give some Dhamma input. So if we find a nice talk or a sutta class, we put it on there. Uh, articles by scholars or bhikkhunis or bhikkhus. Um, so the social media side of things is ongoing. Um, and for me, being here and meeting Buddhist groups, um, sort of spreading myself out really. So recently I went to a meditation centre, as I just mentioned, and um, and there I met a lot of very long-term practitioners and also meditation teachers who are, you know, teaching in the West and are very well respected here. Um, and from these kind of contexts we get more of a sense of where may be a, a fertile place to plant roots. Um, and then, of course, alongside that is the learning how to live as a bikini independently, which is not an easy thing, you know, because most of the time bikini ordination depends on having a supportive bikini community to live in, so that's something that's ongoing. So any help with accommodation for myself or any other bikinis that we invite over here is very much appreciated. So places that I could stay for longer than, you know, maybe for some length of time um, when the time's right. Um, of course, yeah, people can get involved with Ajahn Brown's tour. I think this time we've got already a lot of volunteers who are in the room, and people are coming up with ideas such as creating bags, like little recyclable bags with sort of a quote of Ajahn Brown that will be offered for donations. Um, things like books you can bring in. Last year we had some volunteers who just offered us all these books and allowed us to kind of give them away. Well, we kind of sold them actually, but now we're a charity we have to offer for donation. So we can't do selling as such. But people give because they want to support the project and it's you know, a nice way to, to contribute. Um, so other steps that we're focusing on are getting uh, a very solid trust, um, which may include <coughs> think, looking for new trustees. We could do maybe with one or two new trustees. I mean, at the moment, we're still getting used to having regular meetings and everybody works in different parts of the country. So, you know, sometimes it's not easy to get us all together. But um, as I become more based here, then we can have more regular kind of events, you know, like meetings and like teachings in various places. Um, what else? General volunteers for our actual admin kind of situation. Uh, so at the moment Amina's doing a lot and handling almost everything from the technological side of things and also all the troubleshooting that involves and communications and all sorts of things. We need a webmaster, that's one thing. Um, yeah, whatever skills people have to offer, you can write into us and you can just say, you know, I'd like to volunteer, these are my skills and we can see where we can fit you in. So I think that's the practical stuff. That's good. I'm just wondering whether the people who are involved already could show their hands. So that people yeah, sure. Like, like who is already involved? And put your hands up even if you think so you're hardly involved. Kind of to <laughs> and then maybe people could say in what capacity they're involved too, like even if it's a small thing. So who's, who's already involved? Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> hands up. <laughs> Oh, yes, you are. <laughs> Come on. This inspires others. <laughs> it's yeah. so there's quite a few people in very different ways. So, Some are from the Bentwood Buddhist uh, Society. Yeah, There's a Buddhist group that's been going a long time in Essex. And I think you're sort of uh, leader of the group. The only male in the group, or maybe the second one, is uh, he was actually here... Long, long ago, I think before the monks came over, when Ajahn Chah came to visit. So he's been practicing a really long time. He's very enthusiastic. And I've been invited to their group a few times. And they just keep wanting me to come back and meet them, basically. But uh, if, if I could kind of duplicate myself, it would go a lot faster because I just can't get around that group. <laughs> what about London Buddhist Bihara? Is there? Yeah, well, we did a talk there last year, London okay. Buddhist Bihara. Yeah, Ajahn Brown came there to give a talk. Um, and we were well received, and we're going to do another one there this year. Um, the details aren't up yet, so but but it will happen. Um, yeah, we've made contact with a lot of Buddhist groups, like the Cambridge Buddhist Society, the University Buddhist Society, and the London Buddhist Society, and Leicester Buddhist Vihara, and where else? Just so many, actually. There's a lot. There's more invitations than I can actually take up. 
and I have to get used to my new role, you know, teaching. Actually, I've been resourced enough amongst all this work to, to, <laughs> to offer teaching. Yeah. What about donations given tonight? Is somebody yeah. here taking donations? Yeah, we had to ad hoc it because we actually forgot about uh, yeah. that. But her auntie very kindly put together a little basket outside. It's only a small one, but I'm sure we can fill it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there's a donation box, and everything that comes in will go to the project. So we'll put it in the bank. And the treasurer's wife is here to ensure that that happens. So and now we're a registered charity. Of course, you can make donations and get tax relief for gift aid on that. And um, a particularly useful way of donating is to, pay, is to donate in, what do you call it? Um, hang on. Uh, oh, if, if people do want to uh, uh, make donations to the circle, just um, go on the website and there's a form that they can give yeah. themselves. Yeah. So Great, so there's a form on the website that you can fill in for the gift aid donations. But I was also thinking of, and I can't remember how you call it, standing order, is it? So you, you can also do like regular donations, so if you don't feel you can... And it doesn't matter how much, really. I mean, every time something comes in, it's so touching. There was um, a couple in Sri Lanka who went over there and heard about us before we knew about them. <laughs> and I saw a picture on Facebook of this lady who I'd never met with a huge poster of um, me and Ajahn Brown, you know, for last year's tour. And she went around the Sri Lankan community, all kinds of people, from the poorest people to people in high positions. And she collected donations from about 50 people and showed me the receipts. And it was like some people giving like five rupees, it's like two or three pence, and others were giving more. And it was like, wow, all this has come from so many people. It's just so incredibly beautiful that so many people want to contribute. You know? It's very touching. So, yeah, you can make one off so standing. But I think it, it matures in its own time, and I very much go with my inner feeling on things. Because sometimes I jump around and say, ooh, strike while the iron's hot. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, there's something to be said for that when people are interested and it's very new and very exciting, but you need a long-term sort of interest that's going to sustain you over the years, you know. Um, and for now, it's, I'm finding it quite nice, in a way, not to be completely settled because I still get time for retreats so I'm you know giving a hundred percent when I'm serving and a hundred percent when I'm in retreat as well so although it feels a little bit extreme I notice it brings me very much into the present and there's a lot of surrender and letting go to whatever it is that I'm called to do sometimes I let go to my computer for 12 hours a day you know and I think whoa that's a bit crazy but it, it needs to be done and there's a certain um, making peace with that and learning to be tired and not to actually feel miserable because of the tiredness. <laughs> it's quite a big one. <laughs> yes? Um, I asked this question more respectfully. I'm just curious to understand from the modern day uh, how the Bikuni order was started. Do you have it to finish it like you? How it revived? How I revived? don't know very I'm much. Would you like to answer that one? Yeah. So, the question. so the question was about how uh, how was the the, the Kuni order re, um, re-established in the modern day? Is that correct? Yeah. So, um, so the, so obviously the the Bikuni order began in India with the Buddha, and it it came to Sri Lanka through uh, Bikuni Sangamita and it flourished in Sri Lanka along with the Bhikkhu order, Bhikkhu Sangha. And uh, I can't tell you the, the years because I don't remember, but after several hundred, a number of, a few hundred years of being established in Sri Lanka, um, there were missionary ships going from Sri Lanka to China and taking the, the Bhikkhuni form and also Bhikkhu to China. And um, and meanwhile, um, you know, they were Bikunis were living in Sri Lanka and also in China. I think seventeenth century, I think. Seventeenth century, thank you. And uh, and it flourished in China. So both Bikku and Bikuni flourished in China from that those missionary ships from Sri Lanka. Um, and then over time, as it does in every country, uh, Buddhism has this ability to <laughs> to adapt actually to to the countries in. So over time. In, in China, it, it 
evolved and changed and, and became what we call now Mahayana. Um, and, uh, you know, we have the Theravada countries, the Mahayana countries, and the Vajrayana in, in uh, Tibet and, and Bhutan and so on, in Nepal. And uh, the way we look at it now is like, oh, there are these, generally, there are, oh, there are these different schools and they can't really kind of cross over. But um, what happened was scholars, it, it, you know, started to look at how, you know, what, what, is, what is the Vinaya, actually? You know, and how different is the Vinaya? And there were um, certain Vinayas, so like the Dharma Gupta Vinaya, for example, which is very, very similar, almost exactly the same as the, as the Vinaya that was used in the Pali tradition. So, uh, so you, you can, it, really it's all about how you look at things. And this is where, what you see when, you start, when the scholars start to investigate, it's like how you look at it. So if you look at it one way, you can say, well, you know, Theravada is one thing, Mahayana is something else. So, so you can't take ordination from a Mahayana bhikkhuni because it's not the same. And if you look at it another way, you can say, well, Mahayana is, is not about, it's not about the Vinaya. It's about a way of practice. It's about a difference in a way of practice and, and also some different suttas. But the actual, the actual Vinaya is, is pretty much the same. So if you look at it in that way, if you look at it in terms of the Vinaya lineage, the, that, it, that lineage didn't break. That, that went from India to Sri Lanka to China, and then from China to back to Sri Lanka, actually, and then from, and, and out to many countries, also to um, Malaysia and Taiwan. So the, uh, the ordinations in 1996 and, and 1998, which were the revival, you could say, that, that is still going on now, were taking bhikkhunis from, from the Taiwan tradition, Taiwanese tradition, who kept a Vinaya that was you know, very, very much the same, very, very similar to the Pali Vinaya. And uh, bhikkhus from the, certainly in, in 1998, the bhikkhus from the Theravada tradition in from Sri Lanka. So you had, uh, and many of the women who were then were also Dasasila Mata, who were, had already been living as nuns for a long time, you know, had the practice and, and but didn't have the ordination. So, um, so it was taking what was actually a living lineage of Vinaya lineage, but it's not. It wasn't. A, it didn't remain in the Theravada countries or Theravada tradition. And and so what was given from Sri Lanka to China was then given back from China to Sri Lanka later on. And that that, that same kind of thing has happened in the in the Bhikkhu Sangha, but within the Theravada countries. So you probably know that that um, the Bhikkhu Sangha died out. I think twice. At least twice in in Sri Lanka, you know, and then um, then it was re it was um, ordination was given to bhikkhus from Thailand, so the Siam Nikaya, and then from Burma, I think twice, two different times from Burma. So that's that's a normal thing to go to a country where the the um, order is still living and to take the ordination back to uh, to the country. From there. So that's how it happened, and. Uh, I think in 1996 there was, you know, there was some debate about whether that was valid or not valid, and then because of this thing and that thing, and then in, in 1998, um, you know, it was, it was um, so there was a, a question about uh, whether the ordination was valid um, from bhikkhus and bhikkhunis because the bhikkhunis were not from a Theravada tradition, because they were now in the Theravada tradition, so in, in 1998, there, there was, the ordination was done twice. So first it was done in the same way as in 1996 with bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, and the bhikkhunis were from the, the Mahayana tradition, the Taiwanese Thai Thai bhikkhunis. And then there was, with the same bhikkhunis who were ordained in that, in that Upasampada, then the Sri Lanka bhikkhus again gave them bhikkhu, bhikkhuni ordination just from the bhikkhu sangha, which is also allowed in the Vinaya, actually. So, uh, so they were sort of done twice, you could say, and then, so if, if, if people didn't accept it one way, then they could accept it from the other way. And even with that, you know, people, some people still won't accept it, but you do what you can. And, and there are those, you know, I, I've sat in front of, of bhikkhus who say there are no bikinis. You know, I've sat with six other bikinis and, and uh, with a very respectable senior monk who will just say, there are no bikinis, and, and we just look at him, you know. We're here. It's happening. So um, this is the thing. You just go ahead with with, with what is possible, and you, you know, you look in the vinaya, 
what is possible. There actually, there actually is a, a rule in the Vinaya that says, I allow you bhikkhus to ordain bhikkhunis. So the Buddha allowed the bhikkhus, on, if, you know, if there are no bhikkhunis, the bhikkhus can ordain bhikkhunis. But, um, but it's, uh, you know, some people say that that's not okay. So, so we just kind of, you know, we go as much as you can to what is given by the Buddha and you have your heart aligned in the right way and you go ahead and do it <laughs> and uh, the world responds as it does. Thank you. Okay. So we're a little bit over time. Thank you for your patience. Um, so we'd like to end the evening. If we could uh, just um, share the merits of our practice, just to bring to mind and heart our, you know, our our intention in coming here. Uh, any good that we've done this day and in this lifetime, just bring them to heart. And uh, share the merits of our practice for the benefit of all beings. May those who are friendly, indifferent or hostile, may all beings receive the blessings of our lives, of our practice.